Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and today I'm thrilled to be talking about the Apple TV Plus series, The Dynasty, New England Patriots. We are joined today by director and executive producer Matt Hamachek, executive producer Dallas Rexer, executive producer Miranda Johnson-Smith, and producers Daniel Kohler and Chris James. Um, and Dallas, I was going to come to you for the first question because, um, you know, the, the series is also inspired by and based on Jeff Benedict's book, and I was just interested in how that created the initial roadmap and foundation during the development stages of this series for how you started to envision the way that you wanted to tell such such a complex story because there's so many elements and so many layers to it throughout the entire series. Terrific, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna let Matt answer some of that because he was in from the very beginning, but uh, Jeff was a great collaborator and a great sounding board all the way along. Obviously, he's got an encyclopedic knowledge of this and has lived and breathed it for many years. So um, he was a great, a great asset and a great ally. But Matt, you should probably tell the origin story. Yeah, no. Um, uh, so Daniel Kohler and I were both working on Tiger in for HBO in 2021 when it was just coming out. And Jeff had written the book that inspired that documentary series. And then <clears throat> sort of towards the end of it, he said, by the way, I'm writing this thing about the Patriots. Would you be interested? And I was. Um, and and so came in, you know, not really a Patriots fan. I don't think anybody on this call really was. Um, and, you know, the thing about taking a book and turning it into a documentary series is you can't take words on a page and feed them into a computer and create a scene, right? So in a lot of ways, you really have to start from scratch. I think that when you buy IP or it's part of the deal when you come onto something, one of the things that you're really buying is relationships and trust and things like that. And so, you know, the, the people that Jeff had interviewed for the book, like Teddy Bruschi and a few others, those, those relationships were already there. So when we reached out to those people, we did it through Jeff and then they said, yeah, sure, we'd love to talk because they had that association with them. But really... In a lot of ways, it's just it's starting from scratch and all of us sort of huddling together and saying, OK, what's the story that we want to tell? I love that, you know, and, and especially bringing up the point that that actually for none of you, were you coming into this project as diehard Patriot fans looking to create something that's fan service? And I was interested, um, you know, I'm not sure who wants to jump in on this, in how you actually feel like that broadened the way that you were able to tell the story because you know it's not just coming in and saying look isn't this team amazing and everything they accomplished is great it's also critical analysis analysis throughout and not being afraid of asking difficult questions of people who were there throughout the history um and so how do you feel like actually not being a fan helps to create a much broader complex conversation in the series um i can go so we uh definitely came into this process really interested in the human relationships. So you you look at the Patriots in this this 20 year journey and it's it's a, this collection of really dynamic human beings but also their complex relationships. And on a human level, it's fascinating. So when I first read the dynasty, I just thought of all of these incredible ways to, to explore some of those themes. And we really took that into interview prep, um, you know, some 70 interviews. So it was really kind of a huge collaborative process of figuring out, okay, what is, the most compelling, interesting anecdote we can get from some of these players, some of the coaches, some of the rivals, um, and not necessarily focused on, you know, the, the real kind of, you know, solely 100% football aspect of it. Of course, that was part of it, but also, you know, some of the universal themes and and human stories and and really teasing those out was, was so ex exciting and fun to do. And just to add to that, um, you know, as a as a person that's not really a, a huge football fan, you know, it was it was fun to approach this from the human perspective and not the X's and O's, because, you know, each one of these characters, they have they bring such a richness to the story because it's so deep and it and it goes on for such a, a tremendous amount of time. So it it really did humanize the 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 patriots and the journey that they went on and you know it was it was a, a, a let me think about this it was a um a really collaborative experience not just with with the team itself but you know trying to figure out what those stories are that we wanted to tell with um with the cast i think part of it too is is um 
the uh, when you my, my brother is an Eagles fan, and if you know anything about Eagles fans, therefore I am an Eagles fan as well. I get roped into that. And I think part of this too is trying to reach an audience outside of just the Patriots and making it accessible to to all fans or sometimes not even sports fans. I think that's what's so great about telling the human angle is it it really is accessible to anyone. Um, and and yeah, that's what's so exciting about it. I also feel like one of, one of the intricacies in telling a story like this is you have audience members who are watching the series completely engrossed who've been Patriot fans since childhood. So they know a lot of the history. And then you also know that you're going to have people coming into it that you know, aren't familiar with the team, aren't necessarily even fans of the sport itself. And so how do you strike that balance of making sure that you're giving enough information for people coming in new, but also that you're not feeling repetitive for people who are already engrossed in that world? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that was the the specialty of this editorial team is that there was a really great balance between awareness of what were the key moments strategically, historically, in terms of football, in terms of turning points in the story that we have to get in. But then what's also the human, the human drama, the human dynamics that are going on that any person can relate to. And there were many, many conversations, many edits that we would watch and talk about and try to make sure that we were finding that balance between those two. But I, I think this team excelled at that. And I was very, very pleased to, uh, to see that my my children who are huge fans could enjoy this and myself who likes to make nachos and <laughs> see a little bit less uh, could also really just find myself completely engrossed in the stories. I love that. You know, and it, obviously you all had access to an unprecedented amount of footage. Um, I believe it was over 35,000 hours of footage that's never been seen before. Um, and so what was that process in terms of just starting to go through that footage and starting to earmark, OK, it feels like this could really have a place. Maybe this could be included, but we don't know where, you know, because you can't show all of it at the end of the day. Yeah, I think. Oh. Matt, no, Dan, that? I was going to say you should talk about um, you should talk about the discovery of the rookie symposium footage in in and how we yeah, how, yeah. how we how I, we restruct we restru just talk about like how we restructured the entire episode based off of finding that number. You know, just you can you, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I, as you said, there's this mountain of footage, and that's where I want to do a huge shout out to our incredible logging team. Um, this army of folks who just went through all of footage, and they did an incredible job marking things up and finding gems that otherwise would, would go unfound. Um, one of them, Evan, uh, discovered this rookie symposium footage and uh, it was just amazing. This was featured in the Aaron Hernandez episode and it, it was so good. We had no idea it existed. And we chose, as Matt said, restructured the entire thing around that moment, a key, a key moment in the episode. So it is one of those things that's a daunting task because sometimes it's tyranny of choice. There's so many options because there is so much footage. Um, but that's where you have to really rely on a fantastic group of like logging team, the AEs, all those uh, unsung heroes of the of the editorial team that really did a great job finding all those gems. It's amazing. And, you know, Chris, you were mentioning before, just like the sheer number of interviews that take place in the series. And it's over 70 people that you've interviewed. And it's such a wonderful, broad cross section. Like you mentioned, it's not just players and people involved in the team, it's rivals. You know, you're even giving a voice to fans and kind of their perspective as well throughout. Um, and so what was the starting point for figuring out even just who to approach first, because it's a team that's kind of been very notoriously tight lipped over time. And so it is that journey of building trust with people participating in a show like this oh totally and it was a very much kind of sometimes a, a game of tetris because you know we had our production schedule and then we're talking to people who have really busy lives and busy schedules themselves so it was trying to figure out how to get everything to align and then you know we're in miami we're in boston uh, la wherever we are okay let's get as many people in as we can on these days and and uh, one interesting story was we had an empty slot in Boston and we ended up getting David Nugent, who was Tom Brady's roommate uh, during his rookie year to come we did, fly We didn't do Tennessee. anything, Chris. You got David Nugent. Come on, brag a little well, bit for God's sakes. It, it, and that was just the, that was just kind of one of those strokes of luck that we get sometimes in, in uh, filmmaking where he was able to fly up and he just so happened to have a treasure trove of footage from his time living with Tom. So it, sometimes it just aligned. Other times, as as Matt knows, 
uh, we, we ran into some obstacles. Um, but I, the biggest, the, the real, you know, work was in um, really kind of understanding, okay, what is this person representing um, for the larger story? And, you know, what, what can we tease out of them uh, that they, A, have never really said before, or B, they've said before, but they haven't really expanded on it in a way that, um, you know, is going to actually reveal something new. And Chris, if I can just for a second, Chris is Chris is wore many many hats on this thing. But one of the things that he did extraordinarily well was really reaching out to these people before they ever got to the interview chair. Partly doing pre interviews, but also building up trust with all of them, so that by the time they got to the, our studio and they were in front of a crew of fifteen to twenty people, um, you know, they had somebody there that they already knew and that they were comfortable with. And I think the the thing that worked out really well for all of our interviews is that people were people people were at ease and sort of knew that the that our intentions were good and that we just wanted to ask questions and sort of get out of the way, let them answer. And it's one of the benefits of having a production schedule that's as long as this one was. Um, it it allowed for room to really find the right people, build that trust and conduct the interviews and, and process them properly. I mean, not unlike some schedules where you just don't have that space, I, I, a big shout out to Imagine and Apple TV Plus for, for giving the room for that. I also love the fact that when you have that many people that you're speaking to, there's things that people are going to share that you wouldn't have anticipated or known about at the beginning. And so by the time you get to interview number 45, maybe there's something that's interview number 12 told you about that all of a sudden you now have this extra information. And so how did you find that as the process went through all of these interviews that the earlier ones were kind of shaping and evolving and, and making it more layered in terms of the types of conversations you were able to have with everybody? I just think about Ty Law on that. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I think, I think you're completely right, though. I think, uh, you know, every interview, we, everybody we talk to I think there was, I think every nugget that we got from one person would help inform the things that we asked the next person. And part of this was, as you sort of pointed out, like every fan, every person that knows anything about the Patriots, if they know one thing, it's that this is a team that's kept everybody at arm's length for a very long time. And so one of the things that we benefited from as we got to some of the later interviews is so many people had told us so many things. And then when we talked to them, we'd say, well, we know about, you know, this, this, and this, and this, and this. And then it would see, we would obviously then be able to show them that we had talked to so many other people, and then they would feel more comfortable sharing details with us along the way. And then, yeah, like things that, you know, people had said in interview, you know, whatever, three or four, when they're paired with the interviews at, you know, 50 and uh, 65 or whatever, all of a sudden take on new meaning and new life, not only in terms of an individual scene, but then also most importantly, the arc of this 10 part series, which, you know, one of the things that we all felt strongly about was we didn't want this to be this sort of segmented thing where one episode was an island unto itself. We wanted this to feel like a 10 part movie that that started, had a beginning, middle and an end. So it, you know, it all, it, it all sort of came together to, to feel like that over the course of the 70 plus interviews. And I, I feel like as, as much as with the interviews, we get so much from the conversations and the things and the anecdotes that people are sharing. There's also a lot in the fact that you've left in moments of silence and you've left in moments where, you know, Belichick or Tom Brady, where it's that question that they're not as comfortable speaking about and they kind of go a little bit more inward on themselves. Um, what was the point um, when you kind of all realized, oh, actually, like this tells us just as much as if they gave us a five minute answer to this question for some of those moments? I mean, I think it, for me, it served two purposes, really. One was, I think that sometimes the silence speaks louder than words, but then also it's to make sure the audience understands, especially with Belichick, that there wasn't anything else, right? It wasn't that this is the answer we're showing. And then he went on and talked about all these other things. It's here's, here's how he was and here's, here's what he said. And then, and letting it sit there so that, you know, there was no confusion that this was the answer he gave. But I don't know, does anybody else want to talk about that? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that's special about this is the pacing and the tone of it really takes you into the room. You feel like you're on the inside, you're in the locker room with, with folks, you're sitting next to them having this conversation. And so there's a conversational tone to the edit that makes you feel 
like you're really speaking to this person in real time in real life and it isn't just all chopped up and edited and processed for you and i think i think that's also what people are responding to as they're watching and, and for just, you i'm sorry go ahead no, i was just going to say and to add on to what um dallas says it's a, a lot can be conveyed in the silence as well you know like there there are words that don't necessarily need to be spoken that will get the point across even clearer than if they were to sit there and explain it to you. And you really live in that emotion as well. Definitely. And and kind of off the back of that as well, Dallas, I wanted to also just ask about choosing those moments where you want to have the question that's being asked in the room also part of the scene and part of the audio and where where you kind of felt like you wanted to pull back from that because I, I think it's used very specifically and very beautifully throughout the series as a tool. Yeah, well, we, I think Matt can speak to this, but we had a lot of voices in our heads while we were making this. Obviously, the voices of the fans, the voices of the critics, the voices of the people who said, do we need a Patriots documentary? And so we were we were listening to all those voices and making sure that the questions that they wanted to be asking were asked, but also sharing what we learned along the way, which was a lot of new stuff and things that people hadn't heard before. And I, Dan was the master of all the edits and also I think painstakingly reviewed each and every pause and moment and counted whether that should be three seconds and or whether that was enough and the body language. I don't know, Dan, you, you probably have some moments that you remember of really studying, studying the questions to be asked and the ones that we decided would leave on the edit room floor. Yeah, I mean, it's tricky. I think I think kind of what we've said is is kind of what there is to say about it is there's more power sometimes in the silence. And I, I think there's also power to knowing that those questions were asked, that it's like the, the question was actually asked in the interview chair. And then and then, like Dallas was saying, it's like an opportunity that the interview is its own space where we get to live with that person as they're thinking about that question, processing it. What's we get to project as an audience? I wonder given what, what what else has been set up in the in the story so far, I wonder what they're thinking about. I wonder what they're grappling with. And it's a chance for us as an audience member too to to wonder how how do we feel about that? How do how do so it's just like pause, slow down the story and live in a moment, which is really, I think what we were saying is powerful and, and effective. And also like another example, remember I remember the first cut you did of um Ep one, when we're introducing Drew, that was the first time I you you used a question. Can you talk about that and why you chose to do it? What it did for Drew and his as his character? Yeah, because I think that's part. I, sometimes, can like, can you describe it though? So if you know, so yeah, no, about, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I will. Um, but I think some sometimes, and even starting the edit, that's that's a question sometimes too. Is like, do we want the interview questions to be a part of the edit? And and that's a conversation that Matt and I had, but kind of went back and forth a couple times too. Because I, I think there's value sometimes to, to not having it and just living with with the interviewee's words. Um, but it was a moment where Matt has this great uh, Matt has a, has this great back and forth with Drew, uh, where uh, he talks about being you know the greatest quarterback of all time and and how uh, he uh, under pressure situations that's when he delivers. And Matt kind of jokes, you know, I think I've or you say that I've heard the same thing from Tiger from Jordan. And Drew jokes like, yeah, well, yeah, people put me up there with the likes of Jordan and, and, and Tiger. And it's this great little, it's this joke that humanizes him, but then also it makes it, he's like being self-deprecating, which endears you to him. So he's mm -hmm. making these big, bold claims about being the, the greatest of all time, but then also undercuts that himself. So he makes you a character that you want to believe in because he's also, he, he's he's willing to be self-deprecating. So it's a really important moment to to set him up as this character that we, that we love and, and believe in. Especially because, right, like, you know, Drew is injured right in the opening minutes of the entire thing. So there's very little time to actually make him into a character. So a moment like that, what I thought when I first saw Dan's edit of it was that it was brilliant because it's like it's like literally like 10 seconds away from when he gets kicked, he gets taken out and, you, and he's done. And so just when you start to like this guy, he gets snatched away from you. And that's that's like brilliant storytelling right there. So I, I really like that edit when I first saw it. It is. And and Chris, I'm going to come to you on, on this next question, which, you know, there was, there was mentioned earlier about the production timeline and you guys were working on this and filming this over the course of a couple of years. And it was quite a long production schedule. And 
there must be such a challenge in trying to tell a story, but with something that's still a living, breathing, malleable entity that's continuing to evolve, especially when you're kind of going, okay, what is kind of like the touch point? Where do we want that final point of the show to lead to? Because there's always going to be more story that you could tell. You know, if you went back to this six months from now, there'd be more episodes that you could potentially add. Um, and so what were the challenges that that came with that and really figuring out a lot of the structure? Yeah, I think the, for us, it was it was nice in the sense that we really had uh, zeroed in on the timeline quite early on. Um, and we knew that we wanted this to be the story of Brady Belichick Craft and that 20 year partnership. So it was nice because we kind of had that long 20 year time frame to to work with. Um, but it also helped kind of, you know, really focus us when it came to figuring out interviews, figuring out who we wanted to talk to. Um, and then, you know, I, we, like I probably wrote thousands of questions over the course of uh, the over a year and a half that I was on the project. And a lot of the times we would actually, um, you know, we would segment it into different eras and different periods. Um, so that was actually kind of like a nice guiding principle that we had throughout. Or, or even the starting point sometimes, too. I remember when we when we started, it's like, where do we where do we actually start this thing? And that that Brady Belichick craft kind of that that light that that thing as as a thing that unites the whole 20 year run was a helpful starting point matt you said well when brady when brady comes in that's when the three sort of the pillars come together and then that freed us up to use these backstories these flashbacks or flashbacks to kind of break up the the modern day narrative so um that the three pillars as a helpful guideline was all the way through whether it was the beginning or or the ending that's great, you know, and, and kind of off the back of that as well, um, Miranda, starting with you, I also wanted to just ask about figuring out the individual story of each episode, because I love how we have this kind of overarching narrative of the team, but every single episode, if you watched just that episode, it would tell you such a full and complete story in itself. Um, you know, so what was that journey of going, okay, if we have X number of episodes, okay, you know, obviously this is going to be the Aaron Hernandez one, this is going to be the, the deflate gate focused one, and just really figuring out what those important touch points were it was it was the challenging part because it is such an extensive history but also um it helped us to hone in on what those what the stories were that we wanted to tell and, and how we could focus those stories and find a new way to tell a story that has already been told per se um and leaning into the interviews that you know Chris and the rest of the team had like really worked on crafting and um, to help shape the story that we wanted to tell. Um, but in particular with um, with with Deflategate, you know, finding ways of telling a story in a different in in a new and, and refreshing way, um, I think was Matt and 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 the team who came up with the idea of putting Putin. In at the top of you know that story, which you would never think that it would be a good pairing, but it it was so masterful and and beautifully told that it really kicked off that story in a unique and and um, unexpected way, and it really helped to draw the audience in, and you're learning all this great new information as well. That was actually Jenna Millman. Uh, that idea was from Jenna Millman, one of the executive producers on the show. That was all hers. And Miranda, though, her nickname on the project was the Gatekeeper because the two, with the two of the episodes that she story produced were Spygate and Deflate Gate. So I don't know if that was a name that was given or a name that you you chose as as your official <laughs> Slack name, but uh, the Gatekeeper. It was kind of given, and so I took it because I was like, yeah. "Oh, that's kind of cute." <laughs> One of the things I love about the series is that each episode kind of takes its own rhythm too. And they don't all proceed like we're gonna tell you the story of one year and we'll go through it in sequential order. Some episodes are covering multiple years and all kinds of highs and lows. And some are really zeroing in on one very particular event or moment or kind of transform transformation in the relationship or dynamic. And they each have their own personality. And I think it's it's really unique in a 10 part series to be able to say that each episode kind of has a different flavor and you can, you, we all had our favorites, which I think is kind of fun to pull people and see which one was their favorite. And in talking a little bit more about some of the post-production, um, Danielle, I'm gonna start with you on this because you were talking so beautifully about some of the, the choices before in the edit room. 
I think one of one of the interesting things is watching these scenes and watching these monumental moments from games that people have seen before and you know they know the outcome they know okay it's this year yes of course we know that they won the super bowl so the challenge is then how do you make it feel new and exciting and fresh and like you're adding to that story and i love the choice even just when you're having those really climactic scenes of you know the music composition the way that that can add to something interspersing it with interviews and other footage that you have to add this layered context to what's happening on the field um so i was just interested in the the journey and process of kind of building out those moments in the series yeah, well, I mean, it, it starts, it sort of starts with the team. We had a fantastic edit team. And I think it starts also with the, the team doing the interviews. Part of the reason why all those scenes really sing is because of all, all, all that was able to be like mined uh, from, from the interview, all the new information, new ideas, new thoughts that were, um, that came out of those, the interview process. But in terms of the actual edit, it's, uh, I mean, like I was saying before that it's really tyranny of choice. There's so much footage to work with. Um, which is not always the case with documentary. And so the approach can almost be like from a fiction film perspective. Um, how do you build the drama of that moment? How do you, as the ball is soaring through the air, how do you build the suspense? So, it, you know, whether you so, you, so you feel like you're living through that moment for the first time again, you know, you're watching the game all over again. Um, and I think that's the way we approach at least the game footage is we really, really want to put you there in the audience and go through the experience of watching it again, um, really build the drama, make it feel tense. Um, it's it, one of my, um, one of my brothers lives in the Netherlands and his family is watching it who knows nothing about football. And this was a testament to me, like, oh, this, this thing worked and they're able to watch it. And, and they were like, let's, let's watch this. Let's watch the next one. I was like, well, if non-football people can watch this thing and enjoy it, then I think we, we did a pretty good job making it feel the drama of the game. So, um, yeah, but it's a, it's a huge, um, the entire edit team was just stellar and fantastic and as I said already, the, the interviews, the information that was that was that we were able to get there is just, yeah, it makes our job easy. So and, and I think well, sorry, I was just gonna say I, I think Matt did a great job of um remembering to have fun while we were making mm. this. I mean, it was obviously a ton of work and it was a huge team, and everybody really busted their butts to do this, but I think there was a lot of fun in this and there was a lot of joy and playfulness in the edits. And, and I think if it, any episode was feeling like it wasn't fun, then we'd bring it back into the edit room and work harder on it until it really started to sing. So I think that's a that's a real testament to the direction that we got from Matt Hamachek. Yeah, and yeah. and adv advocating for the, the length of the edit as well. I think that's part, you know, we mentioned like the, yeah. the chance to do interviews over over a course of two years or whatever it was, the same way the edit got to evolve. So you had mentioned like, how do you how do you decide what the episode structures are? Well, those changed over the course of time too. So having the freedom, having the, the time to really immerse ourselves in the footage and, and the flexibility to have those conversations with Matt, Dallas, all, Miranda, Chris, all of us, like be able to, to watch things and rework and rework and rework. Um, that's how things get great, so. And to have, to, to shout out to Apple TV Plus also for not, like there are networks out there that would have said these have to be hour longs. That's what we've paid for. That's what we expect. And very early on, we were able to have conversations with them where we just said, we don't think that's going to work for this. this is, we want to tell the stories that we want to. And they just said, you do it wherever, however you want. And there were, there's episodes that are 35 minutes long and there's ones that are 55 minutes long. And I think working with people at a network or a streamer who are willing to give you that kind of freedom is also what makes for good storytelling. And, and with the fact that you've all created this series that, you know, going back to the earlier conversations about even for fans, there's unexpected details, unexpected moments, um, you know, and you all did so much research and came with like an arsenal of, of knowledge going into the production of this. What were some of the moments that even for all of you became unexpected anecdotes, unexpected details and elements of the story that at the beginning of the filmmaking process, you couldn't have anticipated that were going to be part of this story and you would have captured Chris, why don't you talk about the the Matthew Slater and um, Devin McCourty, the the stuff that opens up episode nine, because you did those interviews, and I'm sure what I want to know what it was like for you to sit across from those guys and and hear some of that stuff. Yeah, so it was interesting interviewing them because they were actually the uh, I might be wrong, but I think they were the only two current players that we had interviewed at the time. Um, so they had they had a really unique kind of vantage point into because they're still living it. I mean, Devin McCourty started on the team in 2010. Um, so he had been there for so long. And 
he was privy to these conversations that we were really uh, eager to know more about. So it was, it was, it felt really illuminating to actually get some of these firsthand perspectives of people who were in the room when there was, um, you know, a meeting between a captain's meeting and, um, you know, we're hearing about Belichick and Brady and some of the tension that was brewing, um, especially during the last few years of this, this dynamic partnership. So it was really, um, it, it also felt really important, just um, I come from a journalism background, so it felt really important to hear from, you know, these two black players of the team who, um, you know, just have garnered so much respect in New England, but against the backdrop of what we know is um, the reality of, of sports in America, but, you know, just America in general and some of some of the tensions that that grew in terms of race relations. So we really got to explore kind of this parallel track of the Patriots, you know, red, white and blue, this American team and some of you know, the real world social issues that were going on at the time. So that, that was a huge privilege to be able to talk to them and to be able to, you know, get some of these really incredible stories. I love that. Well, it's it's such a fantastic series. Um, you know, the, the response to it is so well deserved for all of you. So congratulations on an amazing series. And thank you so much for sharing all of this information and all of these wonderful insights. I appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us.